Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us here today. I'm Fabiana Bakin, Executive Director of the Canadian Premature Babies Foundation. CPBF is a charitable organization, and our mission is to support and educate Canadian families of premature babies. The chat series is one of many initiatives we have to bring information for NICU families and also for healthcare professionals. Here every Friday, we talk with experts, researchers, and parents who share with us their experience and knowledge. Also on our website, canadianpremies.org, parents will find all kinds of resources and support. For example, right now in the face of the fears and anxiety brought by this pandemic, we put together the COVID care program, offering free therapy sessions for families currently in the NICU and one year post discharge. To apply for the COVID care program and watch the videos, visit the resource sections on our website. And today we're gonna to talk about grief and giving back. Parents who have lost a baby during pregnancy or in the months that follow can experience profound grief that changes how they move through the world and change their worldview in a fundamental way. Along with this grief often comes an energy to move, to make changes, to have an impact, to give back. Grief and giving back will be the focus of this premi chat where we'll talk about personal experiences with grief and giving back as well as a broader perspective on giving back through the lens of the provincial program in Ontario, Pregnancy and Infant Loss Network, where all support that is provided to bereaved families is offered by people with a lived experience of loss as peer facilitators. I have joining us here today, Michelle Lafontaine, who is the program manager of the Infant Loss Network, Michelle will be some support provided by the network to her family after the loss of her twins in 2005. Michelle is the vocal to the family that is important because they need to learn how to incorporate the loss of the baby into their lives in order to find hope. Professionally, Michelle has more than 15 years of related experience, coaching and work with families in various capacities and was instrumental in the development and advocacy around the meeting of B141, pregnancy and infant mortality. Michelle, thank you for joining us today. Me today, Fabian. Okay, I think oh, it's not great. And also I have here joining us uh, Kieran uh, Powers, who is a mom of two micro preemies, one that she holds in her heart and one that she holds in her arms. Beckett was born at 23 weeks and five days in July 2017 and died after a short but fierce fight. Lincoln was born at 22 weeks and five days in May 2018, and he spent 141 days in the NICU. He recently started Beacon in honor of her boys to help families find light in the darkness after experiencing baby loss, premature birth, or the NICU. I really want to thank both of you for joining us here today. I know this is a very difficult conversation for many of us who uh, lost a baby or pregnancy and to many people watching us here today, but I think it's absolutely necessary that we share our stories and you share this information with other families so they know they are not alone. So thank you both for accepting our invitation here today. So Kira, let me start with you. I just want you to share your story with us. Uh, and also, I really want to share a story of a 22-weeker baby who made through the NICU against all the odds that we have. So I think you being here is, a, is a, symbolized a lot of hope for families. So share your story with us. Thanks so much for having me. I'm uh, really excited to talk to everybody. Um, so yeah, I, in 2015, I, uh, was diagnosed with cervical cancer. Um, once I went into remission, um, we were really anxious to start our family because we didn't know, you know, what the sort of long-term outcomes might be, what the effect on my fertility would be. So, um, we actually were really fortunate. We got pregnant straight away. Um, but unfortunately had an ectopic pregnancy and I lost, um, one of my fallopian tubes. Um, and so then we went on to IVF and I got pregnant with my son Beckett via IVF in 2017. Um, I was high risk because of my cervical cancer and whatnot, but everything was going really great. 
until about 22 weeks um, when my water broke unexpectedly in the morning. Um, I'm sure quite a lot of the preemie moms um, can relate to a similar story. I woke up in the morning, felt a gush, didn't know what was going on. It had been explained to me that this was like even a possibility. Um, P-prom, as everyone knows, premature, premature rupture of uh, membranes. So um, with P-prom, uh, the majority will deliver within 24 hours or a week. Um, so I went to the hospital, got checked out. They sent me home after monitoring me for about a day. Um, and I was on strict bed rest. Um, things were going okay. I was taking it very seriously uh, until just shy of a week later, I, I went into the hospital to get um, the first of the two steroid shots to help his lungs. Um, and when I was there, I was feeling a little off. So um, they checked me out and, it, and I was dilated two centimeters. So they had originally planned to wait until 24 weeks to admit me for hospital bed rest because of the whole viability thing, which is a whole nother discussion. Um, but they decided to admit me then. So I was admitted. I still had hope or was trying to have hope that, you know, I could hold on. The baby could stay safe um, until a safer gestation. I was hoping for months on hospital bed rest. Uh, but the next day, um, things weren't feeling right. I told the doctors, they checked me, and my cord had prolapsed. Um, they could feel the cord. So that's an obstetric emergency. They pulled the big scary cord um, in the hospital room. And honestly, like I think everybody on the floor came running. Um, they ran me into the OR. Uh, and at that time, they sort of had the discussion with us about um, C-section versus uh, being induced because uh, when your court has prolapsed, the baby has to come out. Um, this is one of those sort of decision points. I think that uh, a lot of lost moms would probably relate to and preemie moms as well that, you know, we were sort of in this very um, difficult, traumatic situation and were forced to make a really important decision that we didn't really have all the information about. I don't feel like we were, you know, well informed about the risks of induction versus infection. Um, and we were strongly encouraged to do, um, to induce. Um, so, you know, we went with the information we had, we trusted the doctors and um, I was induced. Uh, so at that point, it took a long time. I was, um, it was about 36 plus hours between being induced and Beckett being born. Um, in that time, I was thinking, great, you know, we're getting another, more time for him to cook. But little did I know, you know, with the cord out, um, he was kind of intermittently not getting enough oxygen. Um, so I delivered him on July 24th in the early hours of the morning on 2017. Um, he was born one pound, two ounces, 12 inches long, perfect little guy. Um, they whisked him away right away to try to resuscitate. I didn't get to see him. And I know a lot of moms can relate to that. Um, they took him away and they started the resuscitation efforts. Um, I guess one thing I didn't mention too, which I know um, a lot of preview moms can relate to, and, and maybe I'll talk a little bit more about it when we talk about Lincoln, is the discussions with the neonatologists leading up to his birth. Um, I would say in that, you know, four-ish, three, four days that we were in the hospital, they came in about five times to go through the stats with us to talk about, you know, his odds of survival and his odds of long-term impacts. And to me, it felt um, like they were kind of planning his funeral before he was even born. It was very traumatic discussions. It was all about the bad um, and, and nothing about the good potentials and the joy and, and all of that. And I think especially now that we have Lincoln, I realized how much they should be changing in those conversations with parents. Um, so we had decided in those conversations that we wanted them to try to resuscitate um, you know, to the point where it seemed like things were not going to go well. So uh, they took him away, as I mentioned, they um, worked to resuscitate him. I sent my husband in to go and check what was going on. I'm sure a lot of you have been in that room next to the uh, delivery room where they keep the preemies at the beginning. Um, 
and uh, they came in about 20 to 30 minutes later and they said that they were able to resuscitate him, but it took over 20 minutes and that entire time he was um, without oxygen. Um, and they didn't really know if his heart was beating on its own or if it was because of all of the drugs that they gave him. So essentially, you know, there was basically no chance um, that he would survive. So at that time, we made the heart wrenching decision um, that no parent should have to make to uh, withdraw life support. And um, they brought him to me. They stopped pumping the oxygen bag and he fit perfectly on my chest. Like he you know, was always meant to be there. I felt so calm in that moment when he was lying on me. And um, then they stopped um, all the efforts. And at some point he died peacefully in my arms. Um, so he was perfect, you know, he was tiny, but um, so perfect. We spent about eight hours with him together, the three of us as a family. Um, it was the most amazing and most heartbreaking time of my life. Um, and then the next day we left the hospital with our baby in our arms. Um, so that's sort of the story of Beckett. Well, the beginning of his story, because, you know, I really do want to tell his story and he's already making an impact in this world, even though his life was so short. Um, so I went home, uh, after he was born, um, and, you know, crawled into a hole in my basement basically for quite a long time. Um, and one of the things that became quite quickly, I was desperate to get pregnant again. I thought that having another baby, you know, would be the only thing that might make me feel some sort of joy again. Um, so we had to go through several tests to see, you know, wait for the results of the placenta um, to see what had caused it. And they determined that I had had an infection, um, but they did some biopsies and they thought it was an acute infection and had cleared. Um, so they thought that I could get pregnant again and that, you know, it would be better outcomes. I'd be able to go longer. I was super high risk. I had you know, ultrasound, cervical checks every week during that pregnancy. We did IVF again. It was about four or so months after Beckett died. We did IVF and got pregnant with Lincoln. Um, pregnancy after loss was um, very, very difficult. Um, although I wanted a baby so badly, another baby so badly, it was um, very complex, the emotions that came along with being pregnant um, after Beckett. I as soon as I found out I was pregnant, I was expecting to be excited and happy. And, you know, there was, I wouldn't say excitement, but there was some happiness, but there was also just a lot of grief, a lot of guilt, um, a lot of fear and anxiety. And, you know, I was constantly throughout my pregnancy terrified that I was going to lose him too. I was terrified that people would think this meant I was okay and I had moved on and that they would think that this baby was replacing Beckett. And I was terrified that Beckett would think that too. So there's just a lot of complex things going on during that pregnancy. It also was going really, really well until it wasn't. Um, and in one of my sort of regular checks, um, when I was about 20 weeks, uh, they found that my cervix had shortened. It wasn't like a significant amount, but it, we had always had a plan that if there was any kind of change, um, that I would get a cerclage um, and go and to try to just keep the baby in as long as possible just because of my history. So they sent me that day to get the cerclage. By the time I got into the OR, um, my cervix was like basically gone, which they were very surprised about. They didn't know, they, the doctor was like shocked. They didn't know what had happened. Um, so I went immediately on hospital bed rest. Um, they couldn't put the stitch in. So they used something called a pessary, which is, um, you know, to be blunt, basically a, a rubber donut that they put to give you some mechanical support. Uh, and I went immediately on hospital bed rest. Um, the experience overall was incredibly different. I had an OB behind me who knew our history, who had informed me, I had informed myself, 
Um, and my husband and I had, you know, read everything we could. We found stories about like success stories and things like that. And so it was a, a very different experience. Um, and we knew we wanted to do everything we could. Um, was in the hot hospital bed rest for a week when my water broke and then lasted another four or five days. Um, and Lincoln was born at 22 weeks and five days. He was one pound, three ounces. Um, and he came out kicking and punching, which everyone was shocked as a 22 weeker. Um, and so for us, you know, we were terrified. The whole bed rest experience was excruciating. We, you know, had, were thinking that he was going to die too, especially when we knew he was coming. And then when they said that he came out and he was alive and they were able you know, to put the vent in and everything was going well, we were like, oh my God, this is amazing. It was, I think for a lot of people who hadn't had a loss before, having a 22 weeker go in the NICU would be like kind of worst case scenario. But for us, it was our best case scenario. Um, so yeah, so the NICU, you know, I think at first we were like, we're gonna handle this like pros, like no big deal. We're in for a long road, but you know, this isn't, the worst for us. Um, that was sort of what I thought at first. And then there's that honeymoon stage, I think that a lot of people experience in the first few days. And we're like, oh, yeah, we're going to be okay. And then, you know, things started to go wrong. He had a lot of complications, obviously. Um, and I think I, I started to realize, you know, I was very wrong, I wasn't going to be able to cope with this that well. And I think it was really hard knowing what it felt like to break and be broken and be missing a part of your heart. Um, and so every time the phone rang in the middle of the night or every time they did some sort of test or he got an infection, that fear that, you know, this was going to all happen again was there. It just underpinned everything of our entire journey in the NICU. Um, so yeah, NICU after loss, I think, is something people don't talk about that often, but it, it's its own kind of complicated journey, I would say. Absolutely. Um, and I think I need to bring you back for that talk because I think this topic alone, uh, there's so many families on that situation that you really need to bring that up and talk about it because there's a lot of emotions to unpack, I think, during that journey. But Kira, I'm really grateful that you came and shared this story with us. We are going to continue this talk about what you're doing now and your project, but I want to really uh, also listen, hear Michelle's story. Michelle, tell us a little bit about your story because your story is phenomenal to really change your career uh, path after your journey. Yeah, by the similar experience. We, we Michelle, also your audio Michelle, we can't hear you properly. Okay. Can you try to adjust your audio? Um, We're better. Uh, not really. If you go on the bottom of your screen, there is something called Ken and Mike that you can adjust your audio there, hopefully. If I can read here and see if. No. Kira, can you hear her with an echo too or just me? Uh, yeah, I'm hearing the echo as well. Okay. Um, yeah, if you can try to troubleshoot your, your mic. If you go on cam and mic, there is some audio options. I will continue to hear and share in her story what she's doing now and let me get back to you. Is that okay? okay thank you. Okay, okay, Kira, Kira. Let's see if you can okay. get yourself back on with a good audio. So I know this year or was end of last year, we start a new project to support families who have the same experience as you. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so, um, you know, since Becca died and then being in the NICU with Lincoln, um, what's really helped me is finding other people with similar stories, connecting with other families who've been through similar things, and also telling our story. Um, you know, I love to write, and that's always been kind of a, um, a form of therapy for me, on top of obviously I do therapy as well. <laughs> um, but that's something that's really helped me 
And I felt like there was something I could do in order to help other families. So I started, I'm, uh, we're calling it Beacon. So it's a mixture of Beckett and Lincoln's names, um, B-E-C-O-L-N. Um, and essentially my goal is really to support families who um, have lost a baby, um, who have had a preterm birth um, and or who have experienced the NICU and also to support the people that love them. Because one thing I really noticed, you know, after Beckett died and also when we were in the NICU with Lincoln was that my family and friends didn't know what they could do to help. And I think, you know, it's a real struggle for people to, to know what it is they can do. There's a lot of walking on eggshells and worrying that you're going to say or do the wrong thing. So I think people really need some help in sort of you know, working out what that is to do. Um, so I, we have an Instagram account. I've been telling our stories, connecting with other women, um, have a website and a blog. Um, I've been writing some articles. Um, so, and then I'm planning to launch some products um, in the future to things to jazz up the NICU room and um, also like care packages that families and friends could send to families who've had loss that are really curated for that experience. Um, and also another big thing that I really wanna do is, is which we've talked about a lot, Fabiana, is um, to work with hospitals on sort of how they manage these experiences and support families, whether it's through those discussions, um, you know, with the neonatologists and, uh, talking to to healthcare providers about how they can be supporting these families, the conversations they can be having, and then the bereavement services for families after their baby dies as well. Once they're at home, it shouldn't just stop at the hospital. So um, I think there's a lot of things that can be done in this area. Um, and I, Michelle's doing some amazing work as well. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's a, a big area that um, could use some improvement and just connecting with other women, it gives me strength and I hope it gives them comfort as well. Absolutely. Let's see if we can, uh, Michelle, can you unmute yourself and let's see if your audio is better now. Okay, let's give it another shot. Oh, that's, oh, that's great. great. No, okay, go ahead. So I was starting to say that I was really struck by the similarities in our stories. And I think that's a very common thing that happens that once you start talking about this, then you realize how many other people have experienced something similar to yours. So our story started also uh, with an ectopic pregnancy that resulted in the loss of one of my fallopian tubes and discovered that the other one was actually blocked. And so both of my fallopian tubes were removed, which left us with IVF. So we started IVF um, and were so excited on our second attempt to be pregnant with twins. Um, we. I immediately thought to myself, thank goodness I'll never have to go through IVF again. I'll have two babies. I'll never have to do this. This is perfect. Um, and we, I had a wonderful pregnancy, felt great, uh, was really kind of relishing all of this attention that I was getting for being pregnant with twins and how unique this was. And there was no twin pregnancies in my family. My best friend was also pregnant with twins at the time. And we we're just really enjoying uh, this stage in our lives. Um, one morning I woke up and had really uh, intense lower back pain and thought that maybe uh, I just was, you know, working too much and sitting in my chair too long. So I took the dog out for a walk and thought that that might help. And, you know, looking back, those were early signs of labor uh, mm -hmm. at 20 weeks. So I um, went to my local hospital and they essentially said there was nothing that could be done uh, because I was 20 weeks along and didn't feel comfortable leaving it there and asked to be transferred to a different hospital. And so when I got to the other hospital, I felt like at least here, if they are born, then they might be able to do something for them. Uh, it had never crossed our minds that our babies would die. Uh, it was never something that we had imagined. And in fact, I didn't know anybody that this had happened to. I think that there remains this uh, myth about the kind of safe zone after your first trimester. And now is the time you can tell everyone and nothing bad will happen after this point. And it was positively shocking to me that this was happening uh, to us. This was 
um, I really felt like I had paid my dues with my fertility treatments and how could how could I be losing these babies that we had wished for and hoped for for so so long I uh, ended up giving birth to a boy and a girl at 21 weeks and five days and uh, sorry 20 weeks and five days uh, we were told uh, at the hospital that at that stage of gestation every hour counts and that we were holding on as long as possible I remember vividly uh, laying in a hospital bed uh, not allowing anybody uh, to cry in that room because if I cried then that might put some pressure and might force labor and so it was really just this time where I wanted to press pause and just will them to stay right where they were uh, my son's name is Joseph and he was born first uh, he wasn't breathing when he was born and my daughter Elora was born second and she was with us for about six minutes where we could uh, hold both of them uh, really think about you know what this meant for us in this kind of numb foggy state that we were in uh, but yet wanting to soak in every possible second that we had with them uh, forever grateful to the nurses who were able to guide us through what this was going to be like and, and what some of our options were so we were able to hold them um, they were able to kind of gently introduce that possibility to me numerous times through uh, the two days that we were in the hospital trying to keep them um, I think that gentle approach was really important for us because my initial response to holding a baby who wasn't alive was not a positive response um, we we had the chance to have uh, both of our parents come to meet the babies uh, to hold them to take photographs of them and the things that we left the hospital with um, that's all that we have that's all of the memories and so that to really underline that for uh, families and for professionals that these anything that was a part of that experience will be treasured forever in our family yeah. uh, when we we left the hospital after receiving uh, what I could say was excellent medical care and psychosocial care however we left with nothing we had no information about where to go next or what to do or how to be connected uh, to anybody and so what really was saved us I think in the long run um, was a friend of a friend who knew someone who had this loss and connected us with uh, Pale Network at that point. Um, this loss happened on August 23rd 2005 and so we're quite far along in our bereavement journey and uh, looking back on on those early years and early days what those milestones were like uh, they they continue to happen this is I, as you mentioned Fabian in your intro this is something that changes who you are in this world and changes uh, how you move through it and so there did come along with that this eventual energy of, of what does this mean and, and how can we move forward Absolutely. Thank you for sharing your story. It is a, a very difficult journey for all of us. And uh, I feel from my personal experience, I had so much support uh, at the hospital right after my delivery because my baby, I had twins as well. And one of my twins had passed away at 25 weeks. Um, and I had to carry, I carried them for another week until I went into preterm labor and delivered 26 weeks. And there was a very difficult moment when I first delivered through emergency C-section that day it was a quiet room, uh, the delivery room, because Michael, my, my twin A, came out first and he had already passed and there was that silence. And then a few minutes later came Gabriel, 26 weeks, was also whisked away with no crying. So it was a very different experience for me because I had already had the term baby before. It was very difficult, and but the support that I had at the hospital was incredible. I had a lot of support during my pregnancy because we knew Mike was going to pass away uh, before birth. And uh, they prepared us as much as they could to keep memories, to make sure we had a 3D ultrasound, that we had pictures of my pregnancy, and that we were also prepared to talk to my three-year-old about 
the twin brother that was not going to come home because they said he's going to ask about it. And as soon as they were born, uh, they gave me the same clothes that um they had put on michael so we could, could keep that with us they gave him a bracelet with his name and those are the memories that i have the only memories that i have and i remember the nurse asking do you want to take pictures with him which at that time i didn't it was a very strange because i never thought about taking a picture with somebody who was no longer alive um but then i'm so grateful that we did because that is the only uh image that I have of Michael and I know uh, the support of the staff is so important in, in those first few hours um, obviously going home for me I didn't really I came home empty-handed but I kept going back and forth to the hospital for five months because Gabriel is still there and it was very hard for me to process that time it took me a lot of time later on to to grieve Michael um, but I think between the three of us we all had uh, you know, this, as Michelle said in the beginning, this desire to give back and to support others who, came, who are coming after us and having those experiences. Michelle, I really want you to talk about Payo because I think the work that you do is incredible. And there is this, I just, before you go ahead, I wanna share this uh, comment from Lori. Um, I think it is amazing work. I had a silent miscarriage and delivered my 17 week alone in the change room while I was getting ready for my deliver, uh, DNC. What does that stand for, Michelle? Anything? Uh, the pediatric work was very helpful. We had an ICU journey a year later from our 32 week. He's now 10 months old. So, Lori, thank you for sharing that. Michelle, tell us about your work now and how much of being healthy family is. Thank you for that. So uh, it's always, I think what we're learning through the work that we're doing with the Pregnancy and Infant Loss Network or PALE Network is really uh, how important it is to connect with others because the loss of your baby is, is an extremely isolating experience. Um, and as Kieran mentioned earlier, people around you really don't know how to help. They want to, but they, they just don't know how to. So. Um, the work that we do at Pale Network was something that came about first for me as a volunteer, that I, I knew that there was something that I wanted to do, um, especially after hearing from other people that their experience wasn't the same as my experience, that they were connected with supports earlier or that they were able to feel more supported from friends and family. And so there had to be a way to make this better for families. Um, I did go back to Pale Network after uh, having two children. I again had an, a baby through IVF and then adopted a baby after that and once we kind of felt like we were a little bit more on stable ground I then was ready to give back. So I think that that piece of it is important that there while there comes an energy and the days and weeks following your loss there's also a lot of grief work that needs to be done before you can be in a place where you can really make it about somebody else that you're your experience of loss will enhance and enrich that relationship that you build with another family who's newly bereaved, um, but allowing them to hold that space where you're able to inject things from time to time is really what we strive to do at Pale Network with our peer support. Um, so going back and, and becoming part of the board of directors and, and then this incredible MPP, Mike Cole, who introduced Bill 141, that that piece of legislation is foundationally changed uh, the way that we've been able to do this work in our province. So for families to know that there's uh, politicians and government policies that are now uh, directing this work is validation for them that this loss is deserving of attention and deserving of support. So our program is um, free for any families. It's of no cost to families. It is fully funded by the Ministry of Health through Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center. And we are able to offer peer support to any family in Ontario who has experienced the loss of their pregnancy or the death of their baby up to 12 months for any reason, including termination, including suddenly uh, and unexpectedly having your baby die after they've been born healthy. Um, and we feel very privileged to have about 100 families who offer their support in this peer volunteer role. 
And we also, um, the second part of our program is the professional education. So again, much to Kieran's point that there are workshops that we hold to really educate professionals about how to care for families in the most compassionate way possible and have resources to give them uh, when they leave the hospital. So this is such an important work and we would hope many other promises we follow that we are But for families who want to give back on their own, like my here and is doing right now, is there a timeline uh, for families to go back and say, I want to do something for others? So what we've noticed at Pale is that uh, it's around the two year mark that families are feeling like they're ready to think about this. And, and we know that nothing magical happens at two years, that there are families who will feel ready long before that. And there are families who won't feel ready long after that. And so it's really a very unique experience for families. And sometimes when we have families come to Pale Network who feel like they want to give back, we're able to engage them in awareness work and community volunteering uh, where the peer support piece is a little bit different where you're able to again hold space for someone else's loss and not have the need to insert your loss into it in a really um, really powerful way uh, what we've also seen is that those kind of individual initiatives that come they can they can end up being very large scale with things like r fundraisers and and butterfly runs are amazing things that happen throughout our province to very you know smaller things that families are crocheting hats and and selling them and donating proceeds to uh, pregnancy and infant loss awareness so we do recognize that there is an energy that comes with it and part of that i believe is that looking for connection and part of that is i think wanting to make sure that families don't have to go through this alone that there aren't there is that not that level of isolation that you may have experienced yourself that is really work and advice for families. Kieran, any last words for families who are going through the process right now from your experience and how they can embrace the laws and move along? Yeah, I mean, I think there's phases and, you know, time doesn't heal, but it, it does help. So I think in those early days, and this is something my therapist said to me too, was, you know, do whatever you've got to do to get through those early days of grief. Um, you know, whether that's junk food, trashy TV, whatever it is, you know, just kind of do what you've got to do. And then as time goes by, like for me and what we've been talking a lot of, is about the support. I um, joined the, the Mount Sinai um, late loss support group after Beckett died. And that was a lifesaver for me. I met four women there um, who are still good friends of mine and were really a lifeline for me. So if you can find those connections, whether it's social media, um, I've met people all over the world who I've connected with um, through Instagram um, and then just figuring out what it is that's going to make you feel better. So we, not long after Beckett died, uh, my mom, my aunt and I started a project called Beckett's Blankets where um, we got a bunch of volunteer sewers because none of us can sew um, to make little blankets that would fit micro preemies. Um, and so there's one for it. They come in a package of two, one for the baby and then one for the parents to take home. So that's something, you know, in the early days, we felt like we could kind of accomplish like sort of what you said, Michelle, like. In the early days, you might not be able to hold that space for other people, but that's there are some things you can do. And then longer term, I've you know started to be able to talk to people through their experiences. Um, yeah, so I think you just kind of have to do what what works for you. Um, I definitely, I, you know, I mentioned a few times, I highly recommend therapy. <laughs> um, I did actually EMDR recently, which is like a trauma therapy. Um, which was very helpful for me. And I know a lot of other loss and preemie parents um, who have some like NICU PTSD have done it as well and have found it really helpful. Um, so I think there's a lot of different supports. PAL is amazing. Um, CPBF is amazing. So I think there's a lot of opportunities out there for people who are going through this. And you can always reach out to me as well. Thank you, Kieran. And your program has a lot of good information there, especially how the families support um, the, 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 the bereaved parents, which I think is so important. And recently you mentioned 
the movie from Net that is playing now on Netflix that is coming with no warning. I certainly watched that movie without knowing what to expect. And the first scene is a very powerful one that really brings back a lot of memories. So I think that is a lot of uh, uh, good work that you're doing and opening conversations where they don't exist. Because I feel this is a very silent journey for, for parents who lose babies or lose a pregnancy or have a stillbirth that we have to talk about it so they, don't, they know they are not alone. So, Michelle, some final thoughts for the candidates watching us this might be uh, in this journey, early journey, uh, how to help they can and can and along. I think uh, again, it's such an it's such an individual experience, and so Karen absolutely articulated that very very well. That you you will kind of move through things in in a very different way, in a unique way, and. Uh, I would definitely advise for anyone to reach out in a way that makes sense for you. So uh, whether it's a combination of, of peer support and uh, professional counseling, I think that's worked very, very well for families. And allow yourself to move through the emotions that you're experiencing, knowing that you're not alone. And to really be able to start to advocate for what your grief needs are. There are some resources on the Pale Network uh, website for families that are called Helping Others Understand Your Grief so that you can share that with family, with friends, uh, with co-workers even, and with your employer about this is what how to kind of the care of the grieving person. Um, we hear from a lot of families that having to educate others about what they need is a really exhausting experience. And so we are able to put something together and would encourage people to perhaps even identify uh, one person who could kind of be their spokesperson until they're ready uh, to do that work on their own. Oh, you're yeah, on me. But I really want to thank both of you for joining us here today. I really appreciate you sharing your stories, making yourself vulnerable. I feel this is such an important work that you're doing for our community. So I really appreciate both of you and thank you so much for all that you're doing. And if you're walk, uh, watching us from home and if you have a, a loss, reach out. Uh, I share uh, the Beacon website before from Kieran and also the Payo Network website is here. There's a lot of good resources out there, so you're not alone. So thank you, both of you. And I really want to, oh, I'm sorry, Kieran. And I really want to thank everyone for watching us here today. Uh, the video of today's sessions and all the videos from our live series are available on the CPBF website, which is uh, canadianpremise.org. I'm going to share here with you. And we are a charitable organization, and we believe that through education and support, we can empower families, ensuring they are ready to care for their premature babies at home. Visit our website, consider making a donation. Together, we can create a brighter future for all our families. I will see you again next Friday, 1 p.m. Eastern time. Thank you, and stay well.